Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak and in general for the opportunity to be at the Institute for a whole year. Um, so this talk today is going to be a bit more diverse than you're probably used to. And uh, one of the reasons is that I want to tell you a little bit about algebraic combinatorics of what, what this is, but I also want to tell you how it can connect to other areas which may be actually of more, more relevance here to the community at the IAS. So um, I will tell you a little bit about algebraic combinatorics first. So in some sense, classical maybe. And then I will show you how we applied different tools and notions from algebraic combinatorics for uh, result to obtain results in statistical mechanics and, and complexity theory, which are different. The type of results and the type of applications are different. So, so basically, this is a talk which will consist of uh, maybe three parts. And I should also say that com about complexity theory, I actually spoke last, uh, last week in the computer science discrete math seminar for two hours when the lecture was recorded. And so the details of, of uh, that uh, are, are already <laughs> in our possession at the Institute. So uh, that's why it will be in the end and if we just have, if we have enough time. Okay, so so here is uh, is the view of my mathematical world. The, <laughs> there is algebraic combinatorics, which is my original field. It studies generally discrete structures, which came from algebra, algebraic geometry, representation theory, and uh, it's you, it's studying them with discrete methods, and sometimes the other way around. So it might be using <coughs> algebra to obtain purely combinatorial results, or it pertains to maybe permutations or maybe graphs. There are problems of that kind. It uses a lot of generating functions, maybe exact formulas, but maybe even going to asymptotics, and. Uh, so originally, it, it, was it is very connected to representation theory, which is where it really came from and where it still applies sometimes. But now, from what I will tell you today, it also has something to do with statistical mechanics and it also has something to do with complexity theory and more specifically algebraic complexity theory. And. Uh, so the story begins when we start to study the symmetric group of permutations on n letters. And uh, once you have a group, you can study its representation theory. So this is just uh, homomorphisms from the symmetric group in this case to general linear group, basically represent each permutation as some matrix. And there is the notion of irreducibility, as we all know from finite group theory, uh, that um, all the finite groups have uh, ir the ir representations are uh, and they can be classified by their ir irreducible representations. And uh, in the case for the symmetric group, these representations are indexed by integer, the integer partitions of n, and there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the partitions of n and uh, the irreducible representations of Sn, and also there is another one-to-one -one correspondence between partitions and conjugacy classes of the symmetric group, so everything checks out. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and immediately now we go into combinatorics, so these integer partitions, they're sequences of weakly decreasing integers, which in this case should sum up to n. This is what this means, a partition of n. We have a graphical representations in the form of Young diagrams, which are just boxes, arrangements of boxes such that every row contains as many as uh, as many boxes as the corresponding part size here. So. This here, this example, is a partition of uh, five. So we have, oh, sorry, of 10. We have uh, 10 boxes here. 
then the partition is five, three, and two. So these are the three parts of the partition. And there is um, a way to, to describe these irreducible representations of the symmetric group via the so-called uh, standard Young tableau of shape lambda. Um, so there is there is a way to make a so make a basis from such <laughs> um, in the group algebra from uh, such uh, configurations in this in this case and the, what these configurations are we feel the for each uh, lambda which represents in this case which gives you an irreducible representation we fill fill in the numbers from one up to n in these boxes with the condition that they should be strictly increasing along rows and down columns and each number appears exactly once. These are the standard Young tableau and, and there is a correspondence with a, a, ba a basis for, uh, for this spec <coughs> module. And so from here, there is a whole branch of combinatorics which studies objects like this. Uh, the connection with the representation theory, it's not, it's not so clean in some sense, but this discretization actually helps a lot in many, in many cases. And the dual side of the, the, the picture is the general linear group, which also carries a lot of very similar combinatorics to what I just described. So we have the reducible representations of SNR the spec modules and the reducible pol polynomial representations of the general linear group. So general linear group becomes, you're just mapping matrices into maybe bigger matrices. Uh, these are the vial modules and they're indexed by their highest, highest weights and the highest weights for this particular when we study polynomial representations, they are also integer partitions, except that the size of the partitions in this case can be anything, and uh, the only thing that we are bounded by is the length of the, the, the number of non-zero parts of the partition should be at most, well, the size of the, the general linear group in this case. Uh, and we will see very, very quickly structures like this stand, uh, standard Young tableau, and they come again into the, in the study of the representation theory of uh, the general linear group, where this time um, we, ca we consider the characters of, uh, of these vial modules. The, so if uh, these variables represent the eigenvalues of a given matrix from GLN. So this is basically this is a represent this is how we define the conjugacy class in this case. Uh, then the character is of course the trace, um, the trace of the representation in this conjugacy class, and this uh, char the characters of the val modules are the sure functions which uh, have a, ver a closed form determinantal formula, well, determinantal formula, but also, and now we go back into our com into combinatorics, they can be described and defined as the generating functions for the semi-standard Young tableau. So we had standard Young tableau and now we have semi-standard. So what's the difference between these <coughs> objects here and these objects here? The difference is that in the <coughs> semi-standard we can actually repeat the letters, the entries in the boxes. And the condition is that it's weakly, uh, these numbers are weakly increasing along the rows and strictly increasing down columns. So here I can, we have repetitions along the columns strict increase. And when we say this is a generating function for these objects, for each one of these objects, we have an associated weight, which just corresponds to the product of all the corresponding variables. So here we have 
1, 1, this gives us x1, x1, 2, 2, x2, x2, take the product, we have this monomial. So the sure function is actually a very nice polynomial in, in these variables. So obviously with non-negative integer coefficients, which are actually counting such, enumerating such structures. So this is all maybe 100 years old. And uh, so, he, uh, so here are some maybe one can say results from algebraic combinatorics or going into problems and the type of study we'll do. So as we noted, there is this uh, correspondence between the symmetric group and the general linear group. Um, sure value duality somewhere behind and uh, there is also some similarity in the combinatorial structures semi-standard Young tableau, the standard Young tableau. There are nice formulas, so this is a typical, although in this, in this particular case, very old and <laughs> classical combinatorial result is to come up with an exact enumerative formula for, some, for something. So in this particular case, the dimensions of these irreducible representations have very, very, very nice product formulas that, uh, that are, can be immediately read off from this diagram. So in this case, we have a hook length formula and factorial over the product of, for each box in this diagram, we, calc uh, we get a number called the hook, the number of boxes to the right and, to the, and b below it. And a very similar formula holds for the dimension of the vial module or basically the specialization of the sure function. And then when we, so exact enumeration is, uh, is not always possible. We not, don't always have formulas, but we can still maybe do some asymptotics. And um, so these are just some, uh, uh, we are, will not tell you what these pictures mean exactly. So if you know, then, uh, then it's good. But I will talk about this picture a lot more later. So, uh, and uh, and another 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 way of studying such objects and such problems has to do with the notion of combinatorial interpretation. So combinatorial interpretation is actually something very not not precisely defined, but actually computer science here comes into the rescue because the combinatorial interpretation is just a sharp p formula. Um, <coughs> so once we have irreducible representations indexed by these uh, nice uh, objects, the integer partitions, we can talk about the tensor product decomposition. So if we take two uh, irreducible representations of the symmetry group and um, under the diagonal action of the SN, this is again a representation of the symmetry group. And uh, it should decompose into irreducibles, of course, with non-negative multiplicities. So here we get some integers, non-negative integers. They are called the Kronecker coefficients of the, the multiplicity of a particular reducible representation in the tensor product of the others. And um, at the same time, we can we also can ask the same the, do the same decomposition for the general linear group. So we have the tensor product of two <laughs> vial modules decompose into irreducibles. These are the Littlewood-Richardson coefficients. And um, what, uh, what we know about these numbers, the Littlewood-Richardson ones, is that they have such a combinatorial interpretation. So we don't have an exact formula like the one I just showed about the dimension. And there can be no exact formula that's, that's implicity, but um, nonetheless, there is a, uh, 
there is this notion of combinatorial interpretation here, which in this particular case amounts to the following. These little Wood Richardson coefficients are the number of some type of tableau which, which, um, which satisfies a certain restrictions. So these are called little Wood Richardson tableau. So what exactly the rule is in this case, it doesn't really matter. I just want to tell you that there is such, such a combinatorial interpretation. These are in this, in for this particular example that I chose here, uh, there, these are, these are the tens, tensor product for representations corresponding to 4, 3, 2, and 3, 1. Then we're looking for the multiplicity of 7, 4, 3 in here. And it amounts to counting the number of this type of little Wood Richardson tableau. And in this case, they are just two. And we are done in some sense. What is the shape u slash mu mean? Uh, so this is a skew shape. The skew shape and the skew shape is obtained by taking the outer partition, the bigger shape, and then removing everything that belongs to the small partition from inside. So we are just looking at the boxes that belong to the big partition, but not to the small partition. It's like taking a diff, yes? Uh, it's just the equality of numbers. <laughs> so, so if you want to, uh, <coughs> if you want to get some more information about the representation, then you need to bring bring back uh, uh, the other other objects. Yes. Is this six four three? Sorry. No. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yes. Yeah, so there are three three boxes here. That are okay, so. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so the outer partition is six four three and then three one. Oh, this is just but this is just an example of what what kind of answers and questions we can. And the four three two pair corresponds to the number of ones, two, and three. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, d I did not want to go into details of how this rule works, but you know, there is a rule that's the whole, that was the whole point. <laughs> okay, so, and then we can, we have a rule for these numbers. What about the other ones, the Kronecker coefficients? So first of all, these Kronecker coefficients, even though they are for the symmetry group, um, they contain in themselves the little Wood Richardson coefficient. So if you choose the partitions wisely, e so every little Wood Richardson coefficient can be embedded in some sense as a as a Kronecker coefficient. So you can for for every triple of partitions that uh, that makes sense for a little Wood Richardson coefficient, you can actually uh, augment these partitions so that the Kronecker coefficient here, so these are some bigger partitions, are equal to the little Wood Richards. But of course, these are not all. So all the Kronecker coefficients are for every three partitions of the same size, and they, uh, and they, so that they have a lot more complicated structure in some sense. And, uh, and this, is, this is a problem from 1938, which was first posed by Murnaghan. Uh, and, and then taken over by the community. You know, so can we find any way of counting this uh, uh, Given that we already have a combinatorial interpretation for the Little Wood Richardson, what can we say about the chronic here? So is there something, some discrete structure we can count? Or if we want to be more precise, can we show that these coefficients are in sharp p? And what we know so far is that they are in gap p. <laughs> and uh, they're deciding their positivities and p hard. So it's already on the edge of. 
our knowledge. And yeah, so this is this is the problem, and this is basically where where we are with with this. So there are very some only some really special cases that that are known, and I'm not going to list them here. But um, um, No, <laughs> you know you have to. You have to employ some some formulas. It's not. It does not follow from. From this, it doesn't follow. Especially especially if your input is in binary. So if these partitions are given in binary, this is absolutely not obvious. Maybe if you were in unary, then it would be. But <laughs> so. Is already NP hard. And yes. Which is, we, and which, which is which is a miracle in some sense because of the little Wood Richardson happened to to count number of integer lattice lattice points in a very nice polytope in some sense, and this is which is. Can, which, which is not really true for, for the Kronecker coefficients, and of course, you know, proving uh, all of these statements precisely is another another issue. Okay, so uh, so this is this is it as far as the uh, overview of uh, um, uh, algebraic combinatorics and the kind of problems and answers we could. Uh, we we can um, deal with or handle in some sense, and uh, so <laughs> this this so this Kronecker coefficients is other other besides being in like a big open problem on its own, they are actually related to this geometric complexity theory that I may or may not talk about because because of time constraints. But this was what I talked last Tuesday, so. Um, so the re the reason and the reason I'm so I'm mentioning it here is exactly because of this further connection later on. So just out of curiosity, like yeah. actually computationally, like how yeah. large a symmetric group do I have to work with before you can compute to even a moderate size? It's already n equals twenty. Uh -huh. <laughs> Things become <laughs> hard, and it's. Uh, yeah, so I mean, in our our own experience, basically computing, if you depending on how many Kronecker coefficients you want to compute and how you op you optimize your program, basically for some particular case, but it's yeah, I mean, we twenty, thirty, <laughs> yeah, <but laughs> it's uh, and uh, it already becomes very hard. Yeah, also it depends on how many parts the partitions have. So actually the, the, that's the main, the w one of the bottlenecks is the number of parts of the partition. So if you have just li a few few parts, then it's actually easier. But uh, if you just don't want to compute all of them, then it's, yeah. And uh, oh, OK, so. So there, uh, the uh, the other the other point I wanted to make was that <coughs> we can um, so these quantities come are defined from representations, but they can also be defined using the ring of symmetric functions and the sure functions that I just mentioned, and the sure functions and every can can be entirely defined purely combinatorially. So we can actually forget about all the representation theory. If it helps, uh, not not necessarily, but uh, one can study this coefficient just from identities of that kind, which is which is something that we do a lot. Okay, so so let's see how this <laughs> comes into <laughs> statistical mechanics as I just uh, mentioned. So these sure functions. Uh, they are everywhere in some sense, or at least uh, they are related to the representation theory. They are related to various configurations, discrete configurations, and um, in particular, 
it turns out that various models in statistical mechanics, okay, these, these are integrable models, we should, we should say, uh, can be studied a little bit with the help of this normalized true function. So again, the characters of, of GLN, and uh, I will show you exactly what, what this quantities are and what they capture in this model. So somehow turns out that we are able to capture the structure in these models with the help of, of such you know, generating functions in some sense. So this normalized polynomials. So let's, so we will just talk about laws and stylings here. What are laws and stylings? We have the triangular grid. We take a region in this grid, and uh, we tile this region with the three types of rhombi. So the three types of rhombi come from the three three different ways you can uh, take two adjacent uh, triangles in this grid. And of course, the tiling we are interested in tilings, tilings, complete tilings in the sense that where we don't have any. Every triangle is part of a, of a lozenge, of a rhombus, rhombus and uh, there are no gaps in this region. So they are completely covering it. Each uh, triangle is covered by exactly one. And uh, we can, uh, if we color our, t our rhombi with uh, suggestive colors, then we actually get a 3D picture out of, out of this, uh, as, as in this particular case here. So you, this blue tiles I will, off, I will call horizontal because I mean, if, if we think of this as the three possible sides of a cube, then we actually have a 3D picture here. And the blue tiles are the horizontal sides of this cube. Even though the, mod the model is a two-dimensional model, it has a 3D visualization in some sense. And to go back to, to, stati to statistical mechanics, <coughs> we have, we have um, in this particular case, we have a hexagonal grid with uh, two types of atoms that um, and uh, on, on the, these, these, these atoms <coughs> corresponds to the two, so the two poles of a bipolar molecule that we are trying to put on this grid. So given, given the con uh, constraints of these interactions, they, these uh, molecules can only <laughs> uh, occupy the sides, uh, uh, the, the sides on this grid. And the laws and styling really corresponds, as you can see with this cor uh, from from this picture. So each uh, dipole here is uh, corresponds to a lozenge, and uh, there are three the three different orientations are correspond to the three different lozenge tilings, and there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the dimer cover of this hexagonal grid and this lozenge tiling. So this is the immediate bijection and the connection to more classical physic, uh, physics uh, problem. OK, so what kind of questions can we ask here? Uh, so in, in probability and statistical mechanics, the interest is to see how a typical configuration looks like when in when you take some some limit so in this case the limit is going to be the size of the grid and uh, uh, so we can th think of th this as the size of the grid going to zero or or just taking a very large configuration and just uh, shrinking it and um, as as we can see from this picture, this uh, so this in this case we have a hexagon here as the and as the 
domain we are tiling and uh, the tile so as, as we already noted that this corresponds to some kind of 3D structure of boxes and uh, because, because of the combinatorics of the domain and the tiling we actually have a stepped surface so this, this picture is in some sense <laughs> in some sense real and it corresponds to, to a surface with the, without any holes any, any, any way of going inside or anything extra so it's actually a discrete surface that we are looking at this is in one to one correspondence with this lozenge tiling and now we can study the properties of this uh, surface as a uh, as the size goes to as the mesh size goes to zero, and what what the do people the shape of a random one? The shape of a random one. There are many such tilings. And yes. So, and and also it depends. So when we say typical, then we need to specify the distribution. <laughs> so, in this part, so in this particular example, we have we are choosing. Uh, lozenge tiling uniformly at random from all possible tilings of this particular hexagon. But you can also change the distribution to Q to the volume, you can put some local weights for each tiling, and you can, you, you can make this arbitrary complicated, but uh, so, soon you will run out of things you are able to say about it. <laughs> so <laughs> let's just stick to the uniform. <laughs> okay, so uh, what sort of phenomena do people study in this in this ca in these cases? Uh, people observe frozen regions, so with probability one near near these corners, for example, of this um, of this hexagon, you are going to get lozenges of only one one type. So you're getting these flat uh, flat surfaces. If you actually zoom in somewhere in the middle, you have local fluctuations governed by, Ga by Gaussian free field. Then there is a limit shape. Okay, so there are two, two, sh two limit shapes here. One is the circle which is uh, separating these frozen regions from the liquid and gaseous phase inside. And there is a limit surface, and the limit surface basically is is the typical a typical configuration here is actually as a as a three D surface is actually very close to a single deterministic surface in in three dimensions with, with Gaussian fluctuations with Gauss, Gaussian fluctuations yes the Gaussian free field in this case is, is in the heights it's in the heights yes. Um, so the way we will we'll see in a moment how how we parameterize the space, but uh, then in the next another <coughs> question you can ask is what happens actually near the boundary? The fl if you zoom into the flat boundary, you are always going to see uh, these horizontal lozenges. That so if if you sli start slicing. Um, uh, the surface with vertical lines this way, uh, you always have one horizontal lozenge on the first vertical line, then you have two on the next one and so on. And their heights, because of the com combinatorics of these configurations, they, uh, there is an interlacing between these numbers here. And it turns out that if you rescale properly these numbers and you, shi you shift and rescale properly these numbers, their limiting distribution is the same as the eigenvalues from the Gaussian <laughs> unitary ensemble random matrices. And uh, this is something I will actually show how to do right now. Okay, so, so besides the uniform, uniformly random lozenge styling from all tilings of a given domain, you can start. You can start imposing restrictions on on these tilings, which will change the distribution. In in certain in, cer in in some sense, so for example, you can 
study vertically symmetric Lozenstylings, which are also corresponds to Lozenstylings with a free boundary here. So this is not, does not fall into the category of given a particular domain, look at all of them and take one uniform. This is a little bit different. You can impose central symmetry, for example. And uh, one of the reasons I, I, I did this is exactly because one could actually apply the same methods I will show you in a moment to this, to this case. And then you can, you ask the same questions. Fluctuations near the boundary, limit surface, CLT, Gaussian free fields, and so on. Okay, so here is the main conjectures about, about the distribution of the horizontal lozenges near the boundary. It um, comes from Okonko Freshitikin's paper in 2006 where they, they give a more intuitive explanation of why this should be true, but actually in order to prove this rigorously and mathematically, it's a bit more complicated. <coughs> and, uh, and when I said interlacing, so here are the, these are really the, these numbers here represent the vertical heights of the lozenges as you see this on the three dimensions. So here X grows, so this is gonna be, let's say zero, zero, so there is the flat bottom of this surface and then, and then these numbers basically measure how high you are, how many boxes you have underneath. And you have this, these interlacing conditions so what is the, what is the, G, this G, GOE, what is the distribution that we are looking at here? Take a Gauss, the Gaussian unitary ensemble um, are the, er, so um, are ra random matrices which with this, from this distribution here. And um, if we take, so this is a K by K such random matrix. You consider all the principal submatrices here. Take their eigenvalues. So the top, the, the, out, the biggest matrix will have, of course, K eigenvalues, then the next one and so on. And if we arrange the eigenvalues in uh, increasing order, it is actually a linear algebraic statement that, that the, the eigenvalues, all the eigenvalues for the different <laughs> submatrices interlace. So interlace meaning that they satisfy these uh, inequalities. This one is bigger than this one, this one is bigger than this, and so on. So the inequality. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if, if we are drawing our, uh, our random matrices from this Gaussian unitary ensemble distribution, this, this gives a distribution on the eigenvalues and all, all this and the, the entire triangle here that, I, that we have. And this is what is called the GUE corners or GUE minors process. It's basically just the distrib this distribution on, this, um, on these numbers. Yes, <laughs> okay, so that is still the punchline. <laughs> okay, so as you already realize, this is, uh, uh, so, so now, now, uh, now I will bring in the, the Gelf and Settlin patterns and <laughs> for the, from the laws and stylings to see how this is actually related. Uh, <laughs> so, so, we need to we need to somehow parameterize the domains and these laws and stylings that we are studying. So the way I'm gonna do it here, um, and this is unfortunate an unfortunate restriction of the model, but this is uh, what we can do so far. So take uh, take a trapezoid. So here here a flat boundary, here here a flat boundary, and here a flat boundary, and uh, the freedom, the freedom to choose um, to choose the domain will come from what happens on this line. 
And uh, the, way, the way we are going to parameterize or define a domain will be with, with a partition, which is going to tell us where are the horizontal lozenges on this, the last vertical line here. OK, so in this particular example, the partition is 43300 zero, zero because we have horizontal lozenges at height 0, 0. Here we are at height 3 and 3 again. So again, when I, s when I say height, I mean how many boxes I have <laughs> underneath in the 3D picture. So here we have 3, and this is really at the same level there again. Somewhere behind there, there are the three boxes. And here we have four, so one more. And this is this partition is specifying this, this border here. And now we can do, uh, and now we can consider all the tilings in this domain. So this hexagon that I kept showing, which is actually the prototypical example and the first thing that people studied in this, um, in this field 20 years ago, it, uh, it falls in this parametrization with this particular partition. So if we take many zeros and then many a's, here we have, we are basically in enforcing all this to be flat and all this to be flat, giving us a flat, f a flat face here, another flat face here, and from then on we can do whatever we want inside this, this hexagon. And so this is one-to-one -one correspondence with with the um, tilings of the hexagon. Is this a, so, so is that how that boundary was chosen here, or what? I, I didn't quite understand the selection of this particular. Is that special, or is this an example of going vertically up? Uh, here? Yeah. So, thi so this is what I can study. So basically, uh, wh what I'm going the all the results I will show are for domains of this kind. Oh, and that's the generalization on the right side then too? And this, and this is just an example how a hexagon falls into that scheme. Of okay, so that, so you, you already have, so you have a left boundary condition, I see, or in the bottom, but you also have a right boundary condition, which is what you're telling Yeah, me. so somehow we need to define the region, right? Yeah. yeah. So, okay. so this is how we, we, we define the region. So what, what characterizes it again, or is it, no, I, I don't quite understand how you define the region. I guess I see this example, but um, wait, what? So we, we take, so we, these three lines here. Yeah. And uh, for, so there is, there is a big N as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big N is telling us to go N steps away from this uh, origin. Uh -huh. And then, and then on the vertical line that, that passes through the, and here, we are going to specify these corners where they are. Okay. Okay. So, and the way we specify these corners is by, well, by the heights, and the heights are just a partition. So the domain is defined by, by a number n and a partition with n parts, which can be zero as well. And here. And this is an example of how, in this framework, we can, Im we can consider the classical case of the hexagon in this framework with when we set this partition. All right. OK, so here is what the result looks like in, the, in, a, in more, more precision. So if we have, uh, so we are, we are zooming in, in this, this region, so next to the flat boundary, we're considering uniformly random lozenge tilings from the various types of distributions I described. And we take, we draw this vertical line. So this is line k equals three because we are one, two, three away from the border. Take the vertical line, we consider this, uh, this, the positions of the horizontal lozenges, their heights, and we take ev all the other heights as well. And now this is, so these are interlacing, these are exactly like you said, the Gelf Gelf-Unsettling patterns. 
if we subtract a mean and we normalize by something of the order of square root of n, then this, this, this triangle of, of numbers here actually converges in distribution to the Gaussian unitary ensemble corners process that I described earlier. So sorry, did that really cancel each Gaussian section pattern once or is it a different measure? Okay, so, okay, so where does the measure come from? This is this is near near the f uh, sorry, so this is near the flat boundary. <coughs> we are looking at uh, how are we choosing this uniformly random from laws and stylings of a given domain. And so here are the are the different domains that you can you can do this, and you have the same type of result. Of course, these numbers will depend on where your tilings came from. So, so this is uh, no. This is not among all possible Gelfand settling patterns. You are, you have a restriction here on the measure that comes from the fact that you are tiling the bigger space. And when you say that goes to G K, as in n goes to infinity, or yes. So as uh, as the size of the grid goes to infinity. Okay. And there are various. So there, there, there. Here are the various. Result. So, this is a very general for almost any any lambda. So remember, the lambda was defining the this this border here. Uh, as long as lambda somehow changes in a, in some kind of regular fashion, then this thing holds. So it doesn't have to be a, some kind of polygon. It can be something much more ragged in various ways. We cannot even draw it somehow in the limit, but uh, you c we can define it. Um, and here, and then here we have this uh, these tilings with global symmetries that I that I mentioned earlier. So we can take a symmetric along a vertical vertical axis or centrally symmetric, and then you're you're changing the distribution somehow. So it's not uniformly random from all hexagons. It's uh, uniformly random from these more special cases. And but this this still holds. Uh, and the other thing you can do is study the limit surface. So this is a random, a uniformly random Lozen styling of the hexagon. And yes, there is uh, there is a stepped surface here. One can ask what's the distribution, what's the is there really a concentration of measure happening here? Do we, do we have a deterministic limit surface in this model. And yes, it turns out we do the same type of result. So for all this, uh, these different cases of tilings, we can also prove that there is a deterministic limit surface in this case. So this is just a more formal way of phrasing this. And it turns out that the deterministic limit, limit surface is the same in, in the case of the symmetric and the general case. But this is also because inherently the domain possesses the same symmetry as the one we are studying. So we should be expecting that the, typi the typical example, the, the, so the deterministic surface here is obviously possessing the same symmetries and should be. One, one would expect it to be the same, uh, but then we have a difference, and the difference comes in the local fluctuation. So then we, when you take the Gaussian free field, when you impose the various symmetries, you're getting different parameters inside. So these symmetries that you're considering are the ones that you mentioned? Yes, so this global, reflection. either reflection, so this particular one is the vertical one. And with the, I don't have a picture of the, the other. Um, and uh, so a little bit about how the proofs go. So these are our sure functions. They're generating functions for the semi-standard Young tableau, but they are also characters. They are have these determinantal formulas. And we, we take these normalized sure functions. And when you would ask why normalized, well, <laughs> it, it, is like a, it is like a partition function of a model. This is really what, what is going to be. 
so here is how the how the Gelf unsettling patterns work in this particular case. This this is uh, this is uh, I'm going to show you the GOE only. Uh, so we we are considering our tiling near the border. We have this. Uh, the heights of the horizontal lozenges are these numbers here, two for this, zero, three, next line, and so on. And this would give you a Gelfand settling triangle or pattern uh, from, uh, from the representation theory of GLM. And uh, if, we, if we want to fix somehow what happens on the third vertical line, this, this just corresponds to this, this line in this tri uh, triangle. But also, these Gelf unsettling patterns are in one-to-one -one correspondence with this semi-standard Young tableau of shape lambda n. So what is lambda n is, again, lambda n is what is defining our region in the end. And this is lambda n is the bottom line here. And, this, and these partitions also are giving you Young tableau. And if, if we write every single line as a Young tableau with with the numbers here f for the first row one, for the next one, for the next row two, and so on. And we are nesting them on top of each other, which is what the interlacing condition gives. We are going to get a semi-standard Young tableau. Sorry, could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, OK, so this two is a partition. We, we write it here, and we write the numbers 1 in this partition. This 3, 0 is another partition, which is slightly bigger. We write it, we draw it on top of this one. And then, but this, these ones are already taken, so the next box that, that is just left out, it's going to have the number 2. Then the next one is a partition 3, 1, 0. So we draw it on top, and here is the new extra box. We put the number 3, and so on. So the correspondence looks like this. And, uh, and now if we want to keep track of what's happening here, we really need to keep track of this sub-tableau for these um, partitions. And so here is how it really works. The probability that we see a particular configuration, a particular position, lozenge tilings at particular positions on the on the Kade vertical line can be expressed in terms of sure function, skew sure functions as well, and so on. And then we can take a moment generating function of a slightly different kind. So we're really taking the moment generating function uh, where where the uh, the variables are not not just mo no, no, not just monomials, but they they are this uh, the ratio of this uh, these sure functions. And in fact, and when you know this generating function, of course, there is because of the the fact that the sure functions form a basis and all this, you can extract the separate probabilities from this this big expression. And, uh, and then, w and then the, the, ni the nice part is that we can somehow analyze this, this uh, probability moment generating function, or what we call a sure generating function, for these tilings. We have some nice, nice formulas for, uh, for for such tilings and also for the symmetric cases, we have some other characters and showing up. And the point is that uh, one now we can compare this probe, this uh, generating function with the one for the Gaussian unitary ensemble eigenvalues, and we we do some asymptotics here, which is non-trivial on its own, but a separate problem to do the asymptotics of the normalized true function with a given distribution and see that it's really the same. Asymptotically, it's the same as the one for the Gaussian unitary ensemble. And then we get 
the convergence you know, results in this case. Um, and uh, Uh, so, so we had to do them ourselves, and uh, I will. <laughs> okay, so I will. Sh I will actually. I will show you basically. Then the next few slides explain how you can use the same, the same, uh, the same generating function to to derive the uh, limit surface and the existence of the concentration of measure. It's a little bit more complicated, but you do need. <coughs> the same type of asymptotics, so, and by the way, this is how, w in what form you get the limit surface. So this is very impl implicit and the complicated function in the end, so. Uh, and this is, so when you ask what kind of asymptotics, so these are the kind of asymptotics you would get, you would need uh, to do for the sure functions. So first, you, when you take one variable, there is a way to write this as a, an integral. And now we can use Tippett's descent methods and so on. So as long as this, uh, the, so the partition lambda is of course changing with n. So it's uh, one needs to be careful how to do asymptotics in in this case. But you can you can get pretty pretty fine asymptotics for this quantity. That's a single. That's a single, contour, single, single contour, right? Single right, contour, right, yeah. exactly, yeah. And uh, and then depending on the regime and, and ha so h depending on how the partition lambda is changing, you're gonna get different actually, um, different asymptotics and different orders of asymptotics. So this is the type of results you get. So in depending, so. In this substitution, for example, you get Gaussian, um, and and so on. And the, this is for a single variable we need for k, and for k it turns out that we can derive this for with a determinant of operators from the single variable one. So we all we needed to do is the asymptotics for the single variable case, and then we can get the one for the future and there are various independence type of results here but so in the limit you have to have iteration in, in, or I didn't understand no Is so one variable so if you know if you know the symptotics well enough for one variable okay. and of course so we need to to keep track of how this op this matrix of operators or this um, uh, is behaved acting on, on yes on the, the on the single variable, so of course, for the convergence issues, you need you need to be careful when you take derivatives. So these operators are just uh, some some partial derivatives <coughs> applied on this. So um, it's not it's not immediate. Of course, it, it it depends on what sort of convergence results you get here in order to apply the the symptot you in order to be able to do to take the operators and get an asymptotic. Asymptotic yeah, results. Yeah, right. yeah. And uh, okay, so that's the type of uh, so this is this is, this is the type of uh, symptotics we needed to do for the sure functions. But so the application came from in some sense the combinatorics, and of course the symptotics now is completely non-combinatorial. So, so that's it's another problem. Uh, okay, so this is it's three o'clock. <laughs> so I was gonna tell you about complexity, but uh, because I already talked about this last week, so we can uh, we can skip this probably. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>